Welcome to World Thrombosis Day. Oh, 2022 webinar. It's co-hosted by the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis and also by the Division of Blood Disorders at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is usually known as the CDC. We're happy to have you here with us for today's webinar on how to support VT risk assessment across global healthcare systems. So I'm Bev Professor Beverly Hunt, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today alongside my colleague, Dr. Claire McClintock. Together, uh, we are chair and vice chair of World Thrombosis Day Steering Committee, and we have 16 eminent scientific experts around the world making up the committee. I, I am myself based in London, and I am a consultant at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital, majoring in thrombosis and hemostasis, and I'm also professor of thrombosis and hemostasis at King's College London. My co-moderator, Claire McClintock, lives in Auckland, where unfortunately it's very early in the morning, and she is a clinical and laboratory hematologist in obstetric medicine for National Women's Health at Auckland City Hospital. She's also the former president of the ISTH. Happy to have you here with us, Claire. Happy to be here. Happy World Thrombosis Day, because it's already the 13th for us it is for in you. the Antipodes. So that will be for one of our speakers too, Professor Colonel. Fantastic. So for today's webinar, we'll be taking a closer look at venous thromboembolism, which we call VTE risk assessments. And we are going to cover from how to improve, establish VTE risk assessment, on to share several case studies of how this is being done across the world, because as we all know, there are many ways of dealing with the problem. Our goal today is for you, our listener, to have a better understanding of VT risk assessment and leave with plans on how you can develop, implement or improve your own VT risk assessment at your institution or local healthcare systems. And I suspect we've got a few VT patients listening too, and we hope it's helpful for you so you can share what you know with your local healthcare teams. For this discussion, we have brought together leading thrombosis experts from across the world to bring you the latest information and research. And our presenters include Professor Andy Cohen, Professor Fianola Dinani, Professor Stefano Barco, and Professor Jenny Curlo, who I will introduce uh, before each of their presentations. Before we get started, we'd like to know a little bit about you. We have two poll questions today, which you'll see in the polling portion of the webinar platform. The first poll question is, which region of the world are you from? I will give you a moment to provide your response. Are we going to see the response? Well, I can see that we have a diverse audience with us and uh, representing many regions across the world. Uh, it's great to have you all on board. The second question is, if you're a healthcare provider, does your institution or healthcare system have a VT risk assessment protocol in place? Well, thank you for sharing your responses with us. I can't quite see them at the moment, but no doubt I'll be able to tell you about them a little bit later. So now we're ready to start our dive in. Uh, I'd quickly like to review a few technical matters and let you know how to participate in today's session. So please submit questions using the Q&A option in the webinar platform. You can submit your questions at any time. Uh, 
uh, and we'll address the questions at the end during the Q&A session. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent out via email following the conclusion of the webinar. OK, we're off. I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Ander Cohen, who will be speaking on the components of an ideal VTE risk assessment. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Dr. Cohen as uh, a partner in crime at Guy's and St. Thomas's. As you all know, he is an international expert uh, in VTE. He's particularly wonderful at epidemiology and he's very good at designing, managing and analyzing clinical trials and sits on a number of international steering committees. So, Ander, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Beverly and Claire and dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure to join you on World Thrombosis Day uh, and uh, a great honor for me to get to talk about the ideal VTE risk assessment tool. And in a nutshell, um, it's a bit like someone who's run a half marathon and they've been told actually you're running a marathon because we've come a long way and there's been an extraordinary amount of work done, but we've got a long way to go too. Uh, I'll uh, just move on to the next slide, if I may. So um, I'm talking about the components of an ideal risk assessment. And uh, this is where I work with Beverly at St. Thomas's and Guy's Hospital. And I'm grateful to the colleagues that are there today working while we're speaking. These are my disclosures for research support, consultancy and honoraria. And I just ask you to keep those in mind while I'm talking. Next slide, please. So why do we need a RAM? Well, this is a slide um, I prepared almost 20 years ago. And um, although we've come a long way, uh, not much has changed. And really the main thing is to identify patients at significant risk of VTE. What we see in the top left-hand corner there, I mean, it's all about, uh, that, that aim, but we want to improve the use of thromboprophylaxis in, in VTE. We want to contain costs. We want to simplify decision-making. And I think that my colleagues in the UK have done a very good job of that. And also to reduce the burden of VTE, which they've done a good job of. Uh, oh. So suspicion is the key. You've got to look, if you're not suspecting something, you'll never find it. And having, having a, a healthy uh, concern about something happening makes, makes a huge difference. Next slide, please. And that doesn't matter if we're talking about surgery, as in uh, this patient from China, or in the next slide, we'll see talking about patients with medical illnesses. And remember that there are about 20 million acute admissions for medical illness in the EU and US, and I'll have to add, and Great Britain as well, uh, since on an annual basis. And this is a, a, a medical patient we see on the right who died of a massive pulmonary embolism. Or well, the next slide, please. The ones we've been concentrating on in our research recently, the cancer patients, who, who really do have a high risk of thrombosis, and we've got a long way to go to work out who's at risk there. And this is an area where we need to do a lot of work on. Next slide, please. So way back uh, almost 20 years ago, we did an analysis, the Mednox study, which we published in 1999, but we did an analysis of the Mednox study. And this is about as pure as data gets in the sense that this was a, a randomized placebo controlled trial. And what we were able to say is, yes, these patients were at risk. So we could look at the rates of thrombosis. And yes, the risk was reduced by thromboprophylaxis. And I think that this is quite hard data. Let's go to the next slide, please. We also did a what we called a multivariate analysis then 
And interestingly, the robust risk factors apart um, from the from the the treatment groups or the diagnostic groups were a history of malignancy, a history of venous thrombosis, if there was a complicating infection or age over 75. Now, those risk factors are true today as they were 20 years ago. And they're the exact risk factors that we find for patients having a risk of thrombosis after they leave hospital. So when we did the analyses of the big studies like Apex and Magellan, we found that these were the risk factors plus one more risk factor, which is D-dimer, which I'll come to shortly. Next slide, please. So one way of doing this is what we've taken up in the UK. And I think it's a, a really been an important thing that Professor Hunt and other colleagues have worked on, that all patients should be screened and are they immobile and have a risk factor and give pharmacological prophylaxis where you can. And we decided that around 20 years ago and that these RAMs for say prophylaxis needed to have all these factors we talked about all those time ago, accurate, good prediction, look at the risk benefit, validate them, they're transparent and simple to use. Next slide, please. And then I'll get you to flick through this. We came up with this RAM around 15, 17 years ago about medical patients who are over the age of 40. And we defined based on what we call evidence-based from clinical trials and what we thought was consensus-based based on smaller amounts of data from observational studies. So we could say most medical conditions at risk but we have to include inflammatory disorders as well. Since then, there's been data on inflammatory disorders from observational studies. And if we keep going through, we get a number of other things, the risk factors, some of which are evidence-based, some of which are consensus-based. And then are we going to use pharmacological prophylaxis? And what are we going to use? And then if there's contraindications to use mechanical methods. So this this idea hasn't changed, it's just been simplified. And we have to also identify those patients which aren't going to benefit. And those patients, we don't need to give thromboprophylaxis. So that's the history. Now we're using in the UK an opt-out RAM, and many people do. Consider all the patients, look for contraindications, give thromboprophylaxis. Very simple. And the important data from the hospital episode statistics seems to show that it reduces death from pulmonary embolism. But the ideal RAM, and this is recent data, this is from 2020, some of these figures, and 2017 and 2013, hasn't changed. We need to have these things. And so these, these things are all important. But when we look recently at some work done by Beverly and colleagues published in the BMJ last year, it's the top line that counts. There was, they used a uh, bias assessment tool called ProBAST, looking at the risk of bias. And they looked at all the risk assessment tools, you know, close to, you know, around 20. And what did they find? Overall, every single study had a high risk of bias, or it was unclear because the data wasn't provided to assess bias. And that's an indictment on what we've been doing. We need to do better. The reasons why many of these studies are biased, if we look at the big ones, they're either derived or validated in populations receiving thromboprophylaxis. And if you've got 30, 40, even 50% of patients that we see in studies like the Vienna study, like the Padua study, or like the IMPROVE study, if 40 or 50% of patients are getting thromboprophylaxis, then we don't know what is the effect. We don't know that the high-risk patients have their risk diminished, and the low-risk patients appear to have increased risk relative to the high-risk patients. So it's really quite biased. So what's the future? Well, the future is COVID but nothing's new there. 
we know that the highest frequency is seen in those patients with more severe disease, the ones with a cancer, history of VTE, intensive care. That's nothing new. That's the same with all VTE. We think the risk post-discharge is low, but in certain groups, it might respond to pre pre prevention. But the outpatients seem to have low event rates. The real problem is that we also know that patients with high D-dimers with COVID are at risk, but that's always been the case. We published this over 10 years ago, that it's the patients with the elevated D-dimers at admission to hospital with medical problems, they're the ones who A, have the highest risk and B, respond to treatment, as we see in these histograms. The low D-dimers, not so much. Now, this is the modern problem. We have immobility, we have obesity, and we have air travel. And these three things add up to a lot more than a thrombosis, what we're seeing in our clinics. I would say that you know, we know that 60% of men of my age in their 60s are overweight, and half of those 30% have obesity. That means their BMI is over 30. And we also see immobility. We see the sitting syndromes, the immobility syndromes, and that's something we just don't know about. And finally, I'd like to say there's just one aim in all of this, and that is to prevent death from pulmonary embolism. And I think what we've done so far has been remarkable, but we still have a long way to go. And uh, I look forward to working with you all on solving this problem. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ander. That was a perfect start. Uh, we will discuss some of the things Ander said at the end, but we're going to crack on now. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Fianola Niani, who will discuss VT risk assessment initiatives and her role as the VT national lead in Ireland. She is clinical lead in thrombosis hemostasis and maternal hematology within the Department of within the Department of Hematology at the Matter Hospital in Dublin, Ireland, and she co-directs a translational research group called Sphere at the University College Dublin, Conway Institute, and she's also a former member of the World Thrombosis Day Steering Committee. So it's great to have her back with us today. Over to you, Fianola. Thank you, Beverly, for the very kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so here are my disclosures. It's an honour to share with you the journey towards an Irish national VTE patient safety programme. First, I'd like to acknowledge the phenomenal work being done by VTE committees all around the country. Efforts towards national awareness really took off after the first VTE Dublin scientific conference, which brought together global VTE experts, including so many people here on the panel, and patients with a common goal. 2016 then saw the launch of the patient organisation Thrombosis Ireland by Anne-Marie O'Neill. Thrombosis Ireland and the clinical organisation VTE Ireland enjoy a really powerful partnership and together we are so much stronger. And since 2021, the Thrombosis Ireland VTE Exemplar Awards have recognised national VTE champions and warriors. 2016 also saw the launch of the Irish National Health Services Executive or HSE VTE Collaborative. And this collaborative invited all hospitals to nominate a project team to undergo a quality improvement project to test and implement VTE prevention initiatives. The Institute for Healthcare Improvements QI methodology was followed and hospital teams explored ideas for change in collaboration with patients using a plan, do, study, act or PDSA cycle. The primary aim of the collaborative was to increase the percentage of patients receiving appropriate thromboprophylaxis within 24 hours of admission. And under Kira and uh, Philip's leadership, appropriateness increased from a median of 61% to 81% during the timeline of the collaborative. This equates to 34,000 more patients receiving the appropriate prevention annually in these hospitals. And what about the control phase? 
It was recognised that factors associated with improvement include having a VTE prevention protocol, multidisciplinary education about VTE, and routine checks of compliance with VTE risk assessment. A number of national recommendations were made. First and foremost, it was recommended that a VTE alert card developed by Thrombosis Ireland and the HSE be issued to all hospitalised patients, highlighting the symptoms and signs of a VTE event. National, guideline, national guidance was also developed and a framework was put in place, which amazingly facilitated very rapid responses and guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic under Kira Kirk's leadership. So returning now to our timeline, the first regional VTE committee in Ireland in the Republic of Ireland was established in 2017 in the Ireland East Hospital Group, one of seven hospital groups in the Republic and serving one million people. And you can see them here receiving one, uh, one of their many uh, exemplar awards from um, Thrombosis Ireland. Key outputs from this committee include group guidelines and the development of a VTE da data dashboard and an app to facilitate VTE risk assessment. This dashboard format is an incredibly powerful communication tool that drives VTE related strategy within the organization. And we're deeply grateful to Mick Fitzpatrick, whose brainchild this is. So there has been a truly phenomenal upward trajectory and data collection in the Republic of Ireland to what you can see here, a fully interactive Power BI dashboard with views accessible by individuals at site and group level. And this really gives a rich informative breakdown by subset, aiding approved care and importantly, demand planning. And here they are receiving another VTE exemplar award for this work. An app was also developed by the St. Vincent's Healthcare Group and launched across the entire IEHG. This app permits rapid audit of compliance with VTE risk assessment against the standards set by the National Collaborative. Moving on, the Irish Network for VTE Clinical Trials and Research was launched in 2018, and research outputs now regularly impact on national policy and guidelines. A year later, the Ireland Youth Hospital Group worked with Thrombosis Ireland, the Irish Health Research Board and Healthy Ireland to launch the Stop the Clot VTE Awareness Campaign, which I think will be so familiar to many of those on the call. This five week long campaign, and I know Caroline Cohen is on the line, so huge shout out to her, which reached 1.2 million people in hospitals and in the community was awarded the inaugural World Thrombosis Day Activity of the Year in 2020. A key aim of this campaign was to raise awareness of VTE risk assessment and uh, prevention in pregnancy. So let me tell you about VTE risk assessment in one of our maternity hospitals. Care providers at the Rotunda Maternity Hospital in Dublin had a vision that VTE risk assessment should be made easier in a busy postnatal ward. A team began work in September 2014 through a formal quality and leadership initiative, addressing one of the most complex processes in the very complex environment of the postnatal ward. A postpartum electronic risk assessment tool, the term Thrombocalc, was developed and is now fully embedded in our electronic patient record in the rotunda. It's based on the hospital VTE prevention protocol, which I should say applies the UK threshold for pharmacological thromboprophylaxis. Thrombocalc promotes a systematic approach to individualised VTE prevention with embedded weight-based prescribing guidelines. It has increased VTE risk assessment and appropriate prescription of low molecular heparin. Um, and a large body of work is ongoing to address its potential impact on the reduction of VTE events. It's been extremely successful since implementation. Compliance with VTE risk assessment is on target at greater than 95%. It has also provided crucial data that VTE risk factors are really common in pregnancy and importantly in the postpartum period. In this study, one fifth of women had no VTE risk factors during pregnancy, but delivered them, but developed them during delivery and the postpartum period. And this highlights the crucial importance of repeating a VTE risk assessment postpartum. 
It's a joy to see international VTE awareness also delivering so successfully. The WHO Global Patient Safety Action Plan 2021 to 30 had strong participation from ISTH and the World Thrombosis Day campaign under the leadership of Prof Hunt. And as you can see, prevention of healthcare associated VTE is an important patient safety goal. And this is mirrored in the Irish patient safety strategy of 2019 to 24. So a final look back at our timeline. Crucially, in 2020, the HSE or the Health Services Executive launched a key performance indicator estimating hospital acquired VTE in Ireland. The rates of VTE associated with hospitalisation are now included in a national report circulated to hospital chiefs and quality managers. And I can't overstate how important this is because VTE now features at the highest possible governance level as a safety indicator. And finally, it's a joy to report that this month, the first Irish National Patient Safety Clinical Programme was launched. Its mission, to develop a model of care for awareness, prevention, diagnosis and, and long-term management and treatment of VTE. And I'm truly honored to have been appointed as its first national lead. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And most importantly, I thank most sincerely my tremendous colleagues and friends whose leadership has led to the work presented here today. Thank you, Fianola, for giving that macro view of all the work that's happened in Ireland. And I don't think it would have happened without your input. So thank you for that. We are now moving on to Professor Stefano Barco, who has been working on a number of surveys looking at VT prevention. He is a research group leader for the Center of Thrombosis and Hemostasis at the University Medical Center in Mainz, Germany. He is also, and we're very fortunate to have him, a member of the World Thrombosis Day Steering Committee. We're looking to hear about your research, Stefano. Thank you for talking. Thank you very much for having me here today. I feel very privileged to be able to present to you the few results of this work done together uh, with the World Thrombosis Day Steering Committee over the past years. And I would start to emphasize that uh, the very first uh, um, uh, international survey um, that uh, was done more than uh, 15 years ago, the Endor study, actually highlighted that only 40% of patients who are admitted because of a medical Ill, uh, illness received appropriate thromboprophylaxis. So our aim over the past years was trying to get actual, actual, uh, uh, so actual figures on how we are performing in terms of risk assessment model, application, and uh, thromboprophylaxis, particularly in medically ill patients and now cancer patients. And so the first uh, survey that uh, Dr. Vendebo, uh, also from the CDC, um, performed a couple of uh, months ago, um, published in JTH, was actually started uh, with a survey of ISTH uh, members, uh, and they were asked whether they were using a VTE risk assessment tool at their uh, centers, and 84% indicated that this was the case. But if you look at um, whether um, this uh, risk assessment tool was actually mandatory at their center, only 68% reported uh, that this was uh, formally integrated in their healthcare system, and only 9% of the countries actually had national guidelines uh, for concerning VT thromboprophylaxis. And what is most striking is that there were major uh, differences between countries, and this is, uh, you can appreciate on the right side, the a major difference that I have just um, mentioned. Um, and this was again done among ISTH members, uh, namely people who are uh, dealing with thrombosis on a daily basis. We then moved and tried to uh, get uh, um, um, current data uh, concerning the appropriate use of thromboprophylaxis in medically ill patients. As I mentioned, the largest survey done in, 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 the, in the prior history, at, the, at least in the pre-direct oral anticoagulants era, showed that only 40% of patients admitted with a medical illness received appropriate thromboprophylaxis, and this was data before 2008. After 2008, we uh, checked more than 20 
uh, seven uh, studies, more than 130,000 patients, and showed that out of patients with a formal indication to thromboprophylaxis, only 55% received it. So to some extent, better than uh, 20 years ago, but still unsatisfactory if you consider that uh, um, the main um, contraindication to thromboprophylaxis were in fact only minor contraindication. And what we found is that there was a striking difference in terms of uh, thromboprophylaxis use uh, across countries and across continents, as you can see in the, in the figure here. And, and this was a, a bit an update of the indoor study, but after this, we also realized that one of the most uh, fragile group of patients is represented by patients and by subject with cancer who are at the highest risk of developing uh, venous thromboembolism. So 20% of subjects living with cancer would experience a VTE during their uh, life, and 20% um, uh, of VTE patients have, in fact, cancer. And it, it's not only a matter of uh, life-threatening complication, in poor, um, impaired quality of life, it's also a matter of being able to provide adequate cancer treatments. And if you experience uh, VTE during the course of cancer disease, then it might be that even cancer treatments should be paused or stopped uh, for, a, that, for, a, for a specific time period. So it's all, always about integrating the knowledge that we have in terms of risk assessment model and optimal thromboprophylaxis in in and out patients to adequate patient awareness, uh, particularly among those living with, with, uh, with um, with cancer. And we see here two main um, topics uh, that uh, and uh, aspects that should be implemented. The first is, as I mentioned, thrombosis prevention. But on the other end, if patients are made aware of the signs, symptoms, and potential complications of venous thromboembolism, this could also lead to a faster uh, recognition of thrombosis and uh, uh, consequently also to an earlier treatment uh, of venous thromboembolism. And um, to better implement this, we um, focused on a specific population of subjects living with cancer, and we launched the first uh, global survey uh, in the setting of the 2022 World Thrombosis Day to provide uh, um, us and, and, and our colleagues and uh, patients uh, all over the world with a snapshot of cutter associated thrombosis awareness in a comprehensive multi-ethnic and multicultural cancer population. But we also wanted to focus on its psychological impact and also on the perception that cancer patients might have concerning venous thromboembolism. Uh, we launched this survey in more than um, 100 countries, not all of them have been activated yet, and we translated the survey in uh, 14 languages uh, today. And the survey itself focused on 27 main uh, teams covering spheres of catheter-associated venous thromboembolism. Uh, uh, the survey has been active for the past um, six to eight weeks, so until now only 745 participants have been included and uh, these uh, are, are uh, from more than 25 countries in five continents. And, and the work, as I said, was uh, led uh, by the World Thrombosis Day with a fantastic uh, led by uh, Dr. Potere, who really took uh, the best efforts to involve patient uh, representative, patient um, um, support uh, groups uh, and also national society for venous thromboembolism and cancer treatment. So this, as I said, was a very comprehensive survey focusing on any type of cancer. You can see here 25% at breast cancer, some at hematological diseases, and there were of course gastrointestinal gynecological cancer among the, um, the, the most the five most frequent. And most of them were still on active uh, treatment, and 40% had a metastatic disease. What we also observe is that approximately 20% of patients had already experienced a venous thromboembolism. And now coming to the results, we were a bit disappointed to uh, appreciate that in fact only 38% uh, of subjects living with cancer uh, received some type of education concerning cancer-associated venous thromboembolism. And in fact, 
they receive some type of education only where they experience um, within thromboembolism themselves. That means they didn't receive any specific uh, education before the occurrence of VTE, but only after the diagnosis of VTE. And you can see here the timing of CAT education was for most patients uh, at the time of VTE diagnosis. And they were not educated on VTE manifestations and they received no specific instructions on what to do if signs or symptoms of VTE would, uh, um, would occur. And as a second uh, part, we focused uh, in the survey on the relevance of CAT education as assessed uh, and uh, um, evaluated by, by the patients. 85% of patients indicated that uh, this should be a priority and more than 50% were indeed uh, unsatisfied with the uh, degree and quality of VTE um, education that they received in the early phases of um, cancer treatments. Um, to, to just conclude this, uh, this, uh, this slide, uh, we also, this is only a, a small uh, summary of the whole bunch of information that we collected. Uh, patients referred uh, uh, or described their, uh, their feelings as tense or anxious feeling or depression or frustration related both to the fact that they didn't know what VTE was, but also to the fact that they received information only after VTE had occurred and nobody told them what to do in the case signs of symptoms were present. So I think these surveys are useful not only to quantify uh, the work that has to be done, but also to point on specific uh, aspects that should be further implemented. And I think that uh, Professor Cohen and Professor uh, Nihaile showed very well which way should be taken to, to uh, implement a risk assessment model use on a local basis. Uh, so CAT education is the center, we believe, of this approach and uh, um, should be better communicated to the patients what VTE is and which kind of signs and symptoms uh, may occur. Then in a hospital, in hospital setting, the formal implementation of risk assessment uh, models is vital to optimize the treatment of these patients and also to have standardized algorithms uh, for specific groups of patients, not only cancer patients. I read in the chat also other subgroup of patients in pregnant uh, women at risk, uh, obese patients, and so on. And of course, also not uh, forget that uh, VT and uh, cancer actually uh, pose a substantial burden also from a psychological point of view. And with this, I would like to conclude the presentation just reminding you to support our work with this uh, global survey. This is the QR code uh, to just uh, directly include uh, patient information from your patients or from your relatives or from yourself. This is an anonymous uh, um, international survey that will be um, continuing over the past, uh, over the next uh, six months at least. So please include your information, use your data and help us uh, to provide better uh, figures on VT awareness in cancer patients. And thank you very much again uh, for being with us today. Thank you, Stefano. I'm going to leave that slide up just for a little bit longer because I think there will be a lot of people who will want their patients to take part in this amazing survey. And the results are quite shocking. I'm sure we'll discuss them further in the question and answer session. So we need to move on to our final presentation today. Uh, we're going to hear from Professor Jenny Curlew on her work as a VTE champion and how others can develop and implement similar protocols in their own health institutions. Professor Curlow uh, is speaking very late at night, or rather early in the morning in uh, Sydney, and uh, she is Director of Clinical Hematology for Western Sydney LHD at Westmead Hospital in Sydney, Australia. And she's co-author of multiple national and state guidance documents on thrombosis in Australia. Thank you, Dr. Curley. Thanks very much, Beverly. It's a pleasure to join you on World Thrombosis Day. I'm just trying to advance that slide. Great. So Warami means good to see you in the language of the Darug people, the traditional custodians of the land in Western Sydney where I work. I recognize their continuous connection to culture, community and country. 
We have five major hospitals in our local health district serving 1.3 million people and multiple statewide services supporting the 8 million people of New South Wales. We're a culturally and linguistically diverse population uh, with two thirds of our people um, having English not as their first language. And our VTE prevention program extends across all the facilities in our local health district, and it's tailored to the community that we serve. So what do we mean by a VTE champion? There may be a designated individual or preferably a team of people who champion VTE prevention by implementing successful VTE prevention strategies, such as individual risk assessment, by engaging and educating both healthcare staff and patients, teaching them about the need for and the benefits of VTE prevention, optimising use of information technology and embedding change into routine workflows to ensure a sustainable VTE prevention program. And this is how we ensure that VTE prevention is the responsibility of everyone who's involved in patient care. And there are many ways to do this. And so I'll describe some of the things that our VTE prevention team has done as an example. One of our Australian national clinical care standards concerns VTE prevention. It's a quality statement and it defines that clinical care patients should be offered in line with current best evidence. And we also have a state-based policy and procedure which defines our roles and responsibilities, providing context for our local VTE prevention program. And just the next slide, it's not moving, thanks. The New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission is an agency for safety and quality improvement. And the CEC partners with clinicians to promote safety and quality in clinical care and to provide enabling resources such as risk assessment, audit and incident investigation tools, and also educational resources for raising awareness of patients as well as for training clinicians. On the next slide, the CEC VTE prevention framework is a guide for our local health districts and, it, and facilities, and it helps us to implement our VTE prevention program. Its aim is to reduce the incidence of hospitalisation related VTE by ensuring that we identify patients with a potential for VTE, assess and document their individual VTE risk, give them appropriate prophylaxis, engage the patient in the VTE prevention process, reassess their VT risk over time and as circumstances change and monitor our performance to improve our processes. On the next slide, our first step was to establish local governance. We established a district VTE prevention expert advisory group, including representatives from all our facilities. And these are the real VTE champions. The team includes a patient representative, safety and quality experts, pharmacists and epidemiologists, and key nursing and medical uh, clinician stakeholders working in fields including surgery, geriatrics, haematology, and maternity. The group's embedded within our larger district clinical governance structure, which provides us with support and also the authority to implement change. Involving key stakeholders enables us to engage a wider group of local clinicians to support and promote prevention activities. And this helps us to include multiple viewpoints and develop shared goals and priorities. Two of our members sit on the statewide CEC VTE Prevention Expert Advisory Group, which facilitates sharing of information so we can learn from each other and access resources to develop and implement innovative ideas. We also undertake activities to promote VTE prevention in collaboration with partners, such as the Thrombosis and Hemostasis Society of Australia and New Zealand. And for example, on World Thrombosis Day, we make use of some of the promotional and educational materials from ISDH, which are provided to sites like ours by fans. And some of our members also participate in an annual World Thrombosis Day walk held during the fans annual scientific meeting. We have multiple initiatives targeted to patients to empower them with understanding. We inform them about what VTE is and how to recognise it, risks associated with hospitalisation and personal risks, how to prevent VTE, risks and benefits of prevention, as well as how long prevention should be continued after discharge. And this helps us to involve them in the decision-making process about VTE prophylaxis and also enables them to advocate for themselves. We make use of some of these resources at the bottom that from the CEC, produced for patients and translated into multiple languages. 
And this includes things like posters in wards and walkways, as well as pamphlets we give to patients. We have a current project using an electronic platform, GoShare, which enables us to distribute written information and or videos direct to individual patients via SMS or email with their consent. And again, makes use of translated materials. And this enables us to share, for patients to share that information with their families as well. And we also include VTE prevention information in our hospital orientation videos, which are available anytime on hospital TV channels. We use a standardised VTE risk assessment tool developed with the CEC and was initially introduced in paper form and subsequently incorporated into the electronic medical record. And there are separate tools for hospitalised patients, maternity patients and outpatients with lower limb injury. And the tool includes clinical decision support, but once the clinicians are familiar with it, they can choose to directly assign risk, but they're prompted to consider both risk factors for VTE and potential contraindications to prophylaxis. And then the decision about prophylaxis is documented. There's also a direct link to our district anticoagulation guidelines to assist in ensuring that they get appropriate prophylaxis. And we have an alert in the electronic medical record prompting risk assessment for all patients within 24 hours of admission. We educate clinicians about the importance of ETE prophylaxis, targeting nursing staff, pharmacists, junior and senior doctors. We use both face-to-face -face and online teaching in small and large groups and incorporate patient stories explaining the implications of ETE in their life. We support clinicians in implementing our VTE prevention strategies with regular, updated local anticoagulation guidelines, including specific VTE prophylaxis advice for subgroups. And we provide a single point of contact for immediate advice when they need it. We involve our junior medical officers in testing and optimising our risk assessment tool and prevention strategies, as well as auditing our performance and assessing incidents when they do occur. And we provide hospital-acquired complication data, including VTE data, to our heads of department on a monthly basis and encouraging sharing of this information at department level with all staff. And on the right, you can see the specifics of, of what we're teaching our staff about. On the next slide is some data from um, our annual audits. These are ones conducted prior to COVID. And you can see the rates of prophylaxis in patients with uh, moderate VTE risk are shown in blue. And despite all the strategies that I've been talking about that we've implemented, you can see we still had room to improve with appropriate VTE prophylaxis rates um, and prescription varying across our different facilities from between 50 and 85%. So one of the keys is evaluating our performance and that's critical to identifying opportunities for further improvement. On the next slide, we also audited our use of the electronic VT risk assessment tool and compared this in 2018 in orange to 2019 in blue. And this data examines the number of times the risk assessment tool was used in each ward over a one month period. The ward with the highest use of the tool is the haematology ward. And I use this to illustrate the impact that an individual VTE champion can have in influencing their team members to complete the risk assessment simply by emphasizing the relevance and the importance of the risk assessment in weekly team meetings. However, the data also led us to investigate what the barriers to use of the tool were in all these other wards. And this led particularly to discussion with our junior medical officers. One of the key issues we identified was that there was a lack of a direct link from the risk assessment tool to the actual prescription of ETA prophylaxis within the electronic medical record. So there was also a disconnect from their usual workflows of the JMOs who were the usual prescribers. So on the next slide, we're now working on a power plan to address these barriers. It'll be embedded within usual workflows for prescription of VTE prophylaxis and have a direct link to the VTE risk assessment tool. Um, clinical decision support and district guidelines will still be linked and there'll be a mandatory alert for uh, prescribing appropriate prophylaxis, whether it's pharmacological or mechanical, and we'll be able to audit electronically on it at an individual patient level. A similar plan was developed, tested and shared by one of our neighbouring health districts, and we'll localise that one to meet our particular needs. 
Uh, on the next slide is is another use of technology to try and improve our VTE prevention, and that's the provision of real-time feedback to monitor performance and identify areas for improvement. We have a simplified version of this dashboard available currently, which allows us to see which patients have had a VTE risk assessment completed, and it can be used by individual teams to optimise their use of the risk assessment tool. But this more detailed dashboard um, is under development and it will enable, enable us to look at a ward or a facility level uh, as to which patients have had a risk assessment, which patients are overdue, what their level of ETE risk is and what type of prophylaxis they have prescribed. And it will also enable us to um, rank our wards and generate some healthy competition to try and optimise our patient care. So just summarising, whilst I, I don't claim to have all the answers, uh, hopefully the example of our trials and tribulations with our VTE prevention program can provide some ideas or inspiration. And there's some of the things that we have found useful are using quality improvement principles, engaging key stakeholders, listening and learning from others, educating and informing both patients and clinicians, using technology and embedding changes of practice in existing workflows, as well as continuously evaluating the effect of our changes and their outcomes. And of course, the real VTE champions for us are our VTE Prevention Expert Advisory Group with the great support from our State Clinical Excellence Commission. Thank you very much, Jenny. What fantastic talks we've had. Uh, we've got nine minutes for questions. Uh, I've had a quick look at all the questions and I'm going to work through, unless Claire's got any other suggestion, uh, through the speakers one by one. And uh, there are quest two questions I'd like you to address. The first is obesity. Should we be dose adjusting uh, low molecular weight heparin in thromboprophylaxis. Go for it. I, I think I think in extreme obesity we should certainly consider dose adjusting low molecular weight heparin. I'm not sure we need to dose adjust DOAX if we're you know the the jury's out there shall we say and certainly the exposure is good in very high body weight patients who are getting therapy for atrial fibrillation or venous thromboembolism. So I'm not sure it would vary much. In fact, the um, bioavailability would be greater for the lower doses than the higher doses. So yes, for low molecular weight heparin and extreme obesity and possibly not for DOAX. Don't you think we need some trials of low weight adjusted low molecular weight heparin against standard? Um, th there's been a bit of research on that and, and there are some small studies but um, we always want trials. We just uh, got to work out where they can uh, be funded from. And, the, you know, the, the, that's a big deal. OK. And the second one is actually nobody has mentioned mechanical thromboprophylaxis. And I think you and I have different views, Ander. Do you want to give your view? Well, I think nobody's mentioned it for good reason. Uh, you're, our, you're talking stockings. Our views, yes, stockings. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about intermittent pneumatic compression uh -huh. or other other factors that are perhaps more um, vigorous in their way of uh, stimulating. My view has always been as a physician that this is a very surgical approach and it basically takes the problem in the south and moves it north. And in actual fact, that's what you see in the trial results. N nothing good in pharma in mechanical prophylaxis in medical patients and stroke patients. And what you do see is a reduction in DVT, but no reduction in PE and no reduction in PE mortality. And that fits with my lifelong hypothesis that stockings just squeeze the problem a bit further up the body. That's my thoughts. Well, I mean, we've done the GAP study in the UK and showed that moderate risk surgical patients have no benefit at all from stockings. We're just starting the PET study, which is going to cluster randomised 20,000 low risk surgical patients to stocking versus no stocking because we think it's going to be of no benefit at all. So that's an exciting study uh, we should hear more about next year. Yeah, OK, we, we, we uh, agree. I, we agree. Then. We, we don't agree. disagree. 
I love IPC though. It does have equivalent effect yeah. to pharmacological yeah. thromboprophylaxis in surgical yeah. patients. Stefano, what a great talk. What are we going to do about this terrible problem that we have that cancer patients don't know about their VT risk? I think one should tackle this challenge on a local basis uh, um, and uh, on top of, of course, international initiatives. So the uh, first step would be discussing with your oncologist at your hospital and implementing also educational program uh, for, 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 your, for your ward and for your uh, colleagues. I think this is the very first step. And if everyone would do it, then we would have uh, solved the problem. And I think that the, the, the message also uh, discussed by, by um, uh, Fionnoir is very, it's very clear. You can make the difference if you start uh, local and then move uh, on a national uh, level and uh, conclude then uh, with this beautiful World Trombosis Day 2022, uh, where these topics are discussed on a global level. Thank you. Uh, Fionnoir, um, there has been some discussion in the questions about electronic stops, by which I mean that the VTE risk assessment is on the electronic platform and you can't do anything for the patient until you've done a VT risk assessment because there's a stop in the system. Do you have that in Ireland? No. Oh, we thank you very much. I think this is such an interesting question. Um, so some, some hospitals do, and um, those that are using the Cerner platform, um, and, and others don't. So the work I showed you in the Rotunda Hospital it's not it's not a hard stop and I think I mean we don't have hard data but I think I think imposing a restriction and imposing penalties on on people from you know in, in effect from being able to care for their patients may this is my my opinion may may not be the the right way to gather um, accurate and useful information for your patient and may not do what we may not it may not help us to achieve what we want to achieve but that is a personal view and not supported by any data um, having said that you know um, it certainly does mean that all patients are accurately are, are risk assessed but whether the risk assessment is accurate or not is another question I definitely room for for research and um, audit great question oh. Well, I, I think it's imperative because most doctors are absolutely wonderful. They will do a VTA risk assessment, but there's just one or two who don't because they're too busy or whatever. And I'm afraid you have to introduce some form of strict regime so everybody gets a risk assessment. But that's probably a personal view. So, Jenny, you've you've told us how you're a VTE champion and we know that we have lots of risk assessment tools out there and one of the questions is what is the best VT risk assessment tool and I think you have to look at each area uh, and come up with the best for you and your service and for that area which risk assessment tools are you using locally so we use a locally developed, a New South Wales, um, so a state risk assessment tool. Um, there's actually three of them. So one of them is for um, patients who are admitted to hospital. One of them's for maternity, and the maternity one is done in the antenatal clinics and also on admission to hospital. Um, and then there's a third one, which is used for outpatients who have lower limb injury who are going to be discharged home. Um, so there are obviously some overlapping commonalities in the different risk assessment tools, but there are also more specific risk factors to the different populations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Claire. We've got two minutes left. OK, well, I have an interesting question here, which I might put to you, um, Professor Kernel. Um, I have a question about uh, and also maybe Anders could comment um, afterwards, a question about how the D-dimer might help us consider VTE risk in pregnancy, um, especially the peripartum period when it's raised. So, um, Jenny, how do, you, how, how do you see the clinical utility of this? And Anders, you mentioned D-dimers, same question to you. Um, so we don't formally use the D-dimer as part of our risk assessment tool. Obviously, there are a number that do. 
Um, and, you know, I guess it's not something that has developed in the tools that we use. And I, I think there's an element of as long as you are assessing risk, you're probably going to get some benefit. Um, and so I'm not sure that you definitely need to have uh, the perfect tool if, as long as it's something that works for you. So, so we don't have D-dimer as part of any of our risk assessment models for any of those cohorts. Anders? I think the use of D-dimers is uh, somewhat limited by the setting. So in settings where you have naturally occurring high D-dimers, it, it, it is not so helpful. So postpartum, uh, it, the D-dimers can be very high and it doesn't help you distinguish. Cancer patients, it doesn't help you. In other situations, it can be very helpful. So it can be helpful for a start uh, in medical patients. It identifies a high-risk cohort and it identifies those high-risk patients that respond to treatment. But we need to learn a lot more about this because we know that medical patients with infections, medical patients with inflammation will also have naturally high D-dimers. And whether that is a marker for thrombosis and responses, we're less certain about. So I think we're, I think this is an area of great study and, and an area of interest too in prevention of recurrences in patients that have uh, venous thrombosis, because we know that the magnitude of the initial D-dimer is probably related to the risk of recurrences. And this is becoming a, a much stronger risk factor as we collect more and more data. So really, really good, uh, fertile area for research. And I look forward to reading some work on this. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, um, I think um, Beverly and I should thank, um, would like to thank all of the speakers um, for um, their work today, uh, Professor Kernel, uh, Professor Cohen, uh, Professor Barco and Professor uh, Pianula, um, thank you so much for um, your presentations this afternoon, morning, evening, and thank you everyone for your attention and your questions, and then over to you Beverly for a final farewell. I think we've gone over time. I just hope everybody who's been listening in will take some of the enthusiasm that's here away to improve your local VT risk assessment. Good luck. And thanks for listening. Thank you.